You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. Welcome back to Crimson Cast. Kalen Clavio, Scott Caulfield joining you on the show. It is Sunday, April 7th, or as we would say in Indiana this week, it's uh, the day before the eclipse. Yes. I don't think the world's ending, Scott. If it does, just prior to Purdue and UConn playing for a national title, I'm not sure that I would complain. Uh, but uh, yes, the, the, the eclipse buzz is, is quite a thing out down here. I don't know how it is up in uh, wine and cheese country, but uh, down here amongst the, the proletariat, it's a pretty big deal. Starting to see some RVs rolling into Bloomington. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very excited for the next 10 years to be talking about eclipse people. And and everybody knowing what I'm talking about, so uh, it's it's an exciting next 48 hours to say the least. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. No, it's it's uh, my wife went. We went shopping yesterday. My wife went shopping. She's like, there's like they're out of like a lot of stuff already. It's like prepping for a you know snowstorm or something. Um, so yeah, uh, it's it's uh, we're excited for it too. We're doing a neighborhood thing. We were gonna drive down to Bloomington. I, I this is my bad eclipse knowledge. Like for a while, I thought that the like Bloomington was the only place getting totality. So I'm like, well, we got to go down to see that. And then like, I looked at the map. And I was like, Oh no, like it's like just an extra, like 40 <laughs> seconds down there. And like, I was going to go and we we're going to stay with my dad. Who's like way older. It would have been like a total mess. And like, it's like, I- I'm happy. I'm not even to deal with traffic. I, this is one of those where like, I have no idea. I don't want to be out, but I'm kind of very curious. Just go on 465 and see what's going on. Cause on the one hand, you'd think by the news reports, like it's like, there's 500,000 people coming to Hamilton County. There's a million people going to Monroe County. It's like, well, that's, that's going to be a straight on the roads, but then it, it, it could feels, just be nothing. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it's either going to be the most overblown thing in right. several years, or it's going to be panic in the year zero, where right. you've got, like, people running each other off the road and, like, people pulling out shotguns at gas stations and demanding, like, the last gallon. I mean, I, either of those scenarios, I feel like, is equally likely. I was walking around Bloomington yesterday and noted that video on, uh, Instagram. No, no one's here. At least no one was here then. I did hear a report from our good friend IU Artifacts, that uh, things were starting to get a little bit dicey downtown yesterday. Uh, so I'll probably go back downtown and see what the heck's going on later. But yeah, you know. I had for it. And like, this is one of those, like people talk about, you know, what's your favorite superpower and all that. Like, I think it'd be great to have two things, like to be able to go back in time, like, I don't know, like five, six, seven thousand years, but also like have an eclipse schedule. Because it'd well, be great to just be like with a group of people and be like, hey, I if I'm going to be king, but I will tell you tomorrow something big is going to happen. And it's like, it'd be great to know that ahead of time. The one thing that concerns me, and I didn't realize this until a couple of days ago. And this actually ties in with the first topic that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to give right. this statement and then do our reads and then we'll go into that topic. Do you know when the last total solar eclipse was in Indiana? Like what year? Uh, I, I don't. It was 1869. Okay. Do you know what else happened in 1869? Uh, uh, Purdue last made a final four. No, I, I don't know. Oh, no. Close. Purdue was founded in 1869. Oh. oh, wow. And I hadn't thought about that until the, like basically yesterday. And so now I'm extra concerned. But we're going we're gonna to take a time out on that and first talk about Home Field Apparel, who is right. our presenting sponsor here on the Back Home Network. We have... It doesn't have an eclipse eclipse section yet. Like I thought they would no, like go into the eclipse. No, no, no home field eclipse glasses. I think that they know this is going to be an overblown event. Home field right. is too great of a brand to sully itself with the <laughs> eclipse. Sure. Right. Okay. But 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 they do so many other things well, like provide the finest in college fashions. Scott's got his his Clemson uh baby tiger hoodie on. Uh, there's so many great things at home field apparel. If you love anything about college sports, you probably like to wear something related to college sports. And and from the very basic but tried and true looks of hoodies and crew necks to some very elaborate t-shirts, everything from college football to men's college basketball to women's college basketball, they've got it. They've also got some racing stuff. We got some indie car drops coming up here relatively soon. They've got some Colts gear. They have a whole section of apparel that's just casual wear with no logos on it because a lot of their stuff's really comfortable. Uh, home field apparel is where you want to go. So check out home field apparel. It's home 23 is the code. If you use it, you get 15% off your first order. They are the presenting sponsors of the assembly call of Crimson Cast, of the X's and Joe's show, of Film Room with Tony Adrania. 
of doing the work, uh, the, the women's basketball podcast or the Crimson Cast women's basketball show, like uh, all under the constellation of the Back Home Network, all brought to you by Home Field Apparel. We appreciate their support. Also, a reminder, Crimson Cast is on Substack. Go check it out, crimsoncast.substack.com. It's free to sign up, get podcasts and the occasional article delivered right to your inbox, and occasionally uh, some extra things. We've also got a VIP section if you'd like to financially support the podcast. It's a, a very minimal amount, $5 a month, $50 a year, and we give you some extra content on top of that. So check it out. Uh, again, crimsoncast.substack.com. One last thing. I don't know where you're listening to your podcast. I know two out of three of you are listening on Apple Podcasts. If you're interested, we are now doing video podcasts at least half the time, if not more, on Spotify. So if you've ever thought about using Spotify as a place to watch or, or listen to podcasts, you can also watch podcasts there now. Uh, so check us out on Spotify. We are on all major podcast platforms. So we'd love to have you tune in on at least one of those. And we send you those links in the Substack. So you get kind of two two things at once. It's nice. Anyway, let's go ahead and dive into things. So let's let's Jump right into what I was just talking about, Scott. Purdue. Celestial. Just a, a Celestial-only so, podcast. Just just talking about the stars. We're actually turning into an astronomy podcast. You know, I mean, Indiana, uh, definitely in retrograde. On Haley's Comet. And here's the thing. It's like, it's it's Ken Palm score is just not the same as the Hale Bop. Like, it just you doesn't know, have the same efficiency. It, it's funny. I, I was just talking to somebody about the Haley's Comet thing yesterday. Were you one of the people that went and, like, stared into a telescope when you were seven years old because of Haley's yeah. Comet? Well, my dad woke me up at like three in the morning. We drove to Brown County. So if you drive, like there's one spot that I will always remember between Bloomington and Nashville, Indiana, where it's like the highest point, like on the hill before you hit like the actual entrance to Brown County State Park. We drove there. We got out. We, and like, I remember doing that. Like there was, I don't remember anybody else being there. So I don't know if we actually saw the comet or if he had the wrong time. But like, I, that's what I remember. I don't quite remember like seeing it. It's like <laughs> your, your memory starts to tr trim down as you get older. But it's like, I remember that. So I, I do remember that. And like, I have a memory of think seeing something but that could just be me making it up in my mind. I, a hundred percent, a similar thing. I wasn't, it wasn't three in the morning. I remember mom taking me and my sister to Columbia. No, it was Cumberland park in in west lafayette where we lived and going and looking through a telescope and i've i remember being you know the, you know you're six or seven years old you don't know what a comet is you know you've right. seen them in the books they're these huge like really exciting looking things and they got like tails flying off of them and you know i get there and i i, I remember looking up in the telescope and i'm like well it's just like it's like a dot it looks like a star look like any other star it's yeah. like what am i supposed to be looking at here it was a very disappointing experience um, I, I hope that the eclipse does not end up being that way. I will say it looks like grew up kids, younger kids. We grew up in a world without Neil deGrasse Tyson. So we didn't have somebody yeah. to make this exciting for us. But yeah. yeah you no, know, it was very much like, I hope that you read your textbooks or, Hey, let's watch PBS. Yeah. It was, it was one of those things where there, there just wasn't a lot of hype around science. Bill Nye was still years away. So <laughs> you know, it was just, it was not a thing as much. And it was, it's like many other things in the eighties. It's like, there was very little effort put into any right. of it. It's like, here, kids, you should be enjoying this. And if you're not, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. And that's essentially where the 80s were. Anyway, I do realize yeah. we're going to Purdue. Sorry. So anyway, Purdue, as I mentioned, founded the year that there was last a total solar eclipse. Here they are in the title game taking on UConn. It's it's really, I, I will say this, a, a lot of this has been presented as kind of like the worst possible scenario for IU fans, this particular title matchup, because on the one hand, either Purdue gets entirely up off the mat and declares themselves an actual like national college basketball program. Finally, after years of being, you know, arguably the best program to never win a title. The I mean, Charles this is Barkley. the Charles Barkley of college basketball. Yeah, program. Yeah, exactly. The Charles Barkley of college basketball. Uh, you know, dating all the maybe Carl Malone because Barkley's funny and I like him. That's so like a great him. point. Yeah, there's there's very little funny about Carl Malone. That 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 actually fits quite well. The, so Purdue going all the way back to the 20s and 30s. You know, great basketball program. John Wooden played there. They were they were awarded a national title back when it was just some dude uh, with like an abacus trying to decide who the best teams were at a time where there was no tournament. Uh, then, you know, they, they went to it. The last time they went to a national title was 1969. They lost that one to UCLA, as many other teams did. And then they've just had this malaise 
where they hadn't been to a Final Four since 1980. They'd been very good. They'd won Big Ten titles. They'd, you know, they'd progressed to the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight multiple times, but they never actually won a title. So you've got that as a scenario, which is not ideal. Or you've got UConn winning their sixth national title since 1999, which would, of course, move them past IU in the all-time record book. Now, I don't really see this as an, a, a dichotomy, Scott. Like, there's there's several teams that have surpassed Indiana or tied Indiana now on the national title chase. And, you know, I remember growing up, it was like, you know, Kentucky and Indiana being tied and then Indiana winning one. And now Indiana's in the lead and North Carolina was well behind. Duke right. was well behind. Uh, and all that's gone. And Indiana has essentially lost its way on the national stage for almost 40 years, 35 years now. And what it's led to is Indiana's place in the national landscape being a lot less. So I personally am not as bothered anywhere close to, I'm not bothered at all, frankly, by the idea that UConn would surpass IU in total national titles. It is representative of how well UConn has treated their own basketball program and how much they've taken it seriously over the course of the last 25 years versus what Indiana has done in that same period of time. I'm also, I, I will say like the Purdue thing, it doesn't bother me. It's annoying, but you know, I take my hat off to Purdue in terms of what they've been able to do. And especially over the last 10 years, but really I think going back the last 20 years with the decision that they were going to end the Katie era on an amicable note, they were going to pick someone and, and uh, essentially they picked right. They, they, they got a bit lucky, but they also did a good job with their due diligence and they've put together a sustainable model of having a really good basketball program. So it is highly annoying that they, and I say this as someone who grew up in West Lafayette and as an IU fan, surrounded by Purdue fans who were not very nice about being Purdue fans, it's annoying that that group of fans is now going to potentially have something to put on the wall that takes like the one talking point that IU fans have had historically away but it's also like it does feel like, well, if it's going to happen, this is you'd, you'd rather have it happen this way as the culmination of sustained growth and sustained excellence rather than it being like a fluke where, hey, you were a six seed in like NC State, like you got really lucky and got all the way to the national title game and somehow managed to win it. Uh, both scenarios are bad. The Purdue one's worse, but they're both kind of just like this is what has happened over the course of time. And it's unfortunate, but this is where we're at. Yeah, I, I actually hadn't even fully thought about the UConn thing until you mentioned it, but because it, it's you are right. I mean, I remember when it was you know North Carolina behind us, Kentucky behind us, and you kind of just like it's like all right, well we're we're getting past <laughs> like that just happens. I I will say there's a there's a more doomsday scenario outside of the you know if if some year Purdue beats us in the tournament and then goes to a title in that year, like that would probably be the most infuriating way for it to happen. The, the Although, positive way to think. It's funny. It's funny you say that though, because you know people forget in 1980 that's what happened. Purdue yeah. beat Indiana. I, I think it was in the regional final, and went to a Final Four. That was the last Final yeah. Four they had in Indianapolis, and they ended yeah. up losing in the first game. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, the 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 the, the silver lining here is no matter what happens, I bet IU is going to be on a graphic Monday night because they'll either have the graphic of the national champions, and then they'll show UConn passing Indiana, or the the. Again, the more galling one might be the Purdue Indiana. Like they'll show the rivalry, and then Purdue, you know, one to five. I, I'm I'm with you. It's the, the Purdue thing is is worse. It's really it's tough, but it's also, you know, I I, I was thinking about this a lot because that's something you and I have talked about a little bit off the pod is like you know Purdue standing in the state and where they fit in, and you know as I, I live on the northern side, I'm Westfield, so we're closer to Purdue. It, it's shocking to me how many people are just like up in Purdue world right now. And I get it. They're good. But, you know, the the scary thing for me is having done a couple of years of youth basketball with my son, seeing, you know, a lot of teams, a lot of kids, like very little IU represented. Like all of the kids go to the Purdue basketball camp. It's like that is for kids seven to 10. And again, very small Westfield. It's like really close to Purdue, but it's like, Purdue is the apex of youth basketball in Indiana. And I, I see this and I'm like, that, that freaks me out. I'm just like, that's, that's not awesome. Now talking a little deeper, like talking to my wife, who's a high school teacher. She's like, you know, 
there's a lot of kids wearing Purdue stuff. There's still a lot of kids wearing Indiana stuff. And it's like, it's still very much down family lines. Like parents who went to IU, their kids are IU fans. And should we, we still send a lot of kids out of the high school to IU. IU has a bigger alumni base. So like, I don't think this is a deal where, you know, it, it Purdue's going to take over the state, you know, but I, I do, I wanted to talk to you about this because I think it's interesting. Like I was trying to think of a comp, like, you know, Georgia was bad in football for a long, or just off the, off the scene in football for a long time. It's not like Georgia state took over and then Georgia just, you know, took it over. Like Georgia tech maybe. <laughs> or, sorry. Sorry. That's what I meant. Georgia tech. Like there, there's no Alabama, you know, secondary school and like, you know, Miami and Florida is, it's a, it, there's really not a good analogy I could think of. I, I will say this. Like, I, I think if IU ever gets its S together and puts together a run, you know, I, I think it'll all be fine. Like, it, it, th that, that engine will come back. But I also feel like, and as an IU fan, I don't like it. Like, I don't like being in that arrogant position of just like, oh, man, we're, it's our state. Like, what you, you win two titles. Who cares? Like, we still got five. It's like, at some point, Purdue could have more than us. Like, we keep doing zero every single year. At some point, they might get six. And it's like, we got nothing. Right. Um, I, I don't know. I just, I don't like that. And I also think, you know, the tough thing that you have in this last couple of days is, you know, the, the two national championship games, you know, NIT, call it what you want, but like Indiana State is in that one. Purdue is in the national championship. You know, Purdue doing better, but like 11 of their 17 players are from the state of Indiana. And, and that's something that Indiana always did as a university was, you know, all those the 81, 87 teams, like it wasn't all Indiana kids, but it was like a good number of Indiana kids to root for. And then you had some other guys sprinkled in, just kind of what Purdue is doing. Indiana State, not so much. Only three of their 15 players are from Indiana, but three are from Illinois, one from Ohio. So kind of region based. And I think that's that to me is the more troubling part is not only is Purdue having success, they're having success with kind of like the Indiana, the old Indiana blueprint. And we're just off in the morass doing whatever. But I, I don't think there's a world where Purdue takes over the state, but I do think that, you know, we're seeding some ground and it is, it, it's just, it, it's more frustrating as all of these things are happening all kind of at the same. And it's like, it's, I, I don't know. It's just, it is, there's no answer here. There's no, nothing to finish this up with, but it's just like, it is not a spot where it makes an IU fan happy. It's just, you kind of get defeated. And I feel very much like I'll end with this. Like you were saying, you know, does this get Indiana in one of your other podcasts? Like, does this get Indiana to get its butt in gear and, and see if something happens? And the sad thing is, I don't think they do because no. this happened with Kentucky. Like, Indiana and Kentucky were kind of at the same level for a while. And then Kentucky just like threw coal on the fire and, like, yeah, peace out. IU, we're going to go win a couple more titles. And it, that was 25 years ago. And Indiana hasn't seemed to woken up. It's like, oh man, Kentucky's, we're not in the same race with Kentucky anymore. Um, and so I don't know if it will shake Indiana up to to do anything. There's a lot to unpack there, but yeah, let's no, no, but no, but I think it's all worth unpacking. I mean, let's start with what you started with, which is this idea of like youth basketball culture in Indiana, and I think a lot of it really ties back to Indiana not really taking seriously the aspects of Indiana basketball from a cultural perspective that matter to the state and Purdue taking advantage of those really yeah. since painter got there. I mean, I think, I think both programs in the early to mid two thousands had kind of lost their way on that a bit, but painter after, you know, a couple of dalliances elsewhere really recentered, you know, around 2004, 2015 and has done a much better job of talent evaluation of building a brand among high school and AAU programs in terms of getting, uh, the types of players that can lead to sustainable success, not necessarily the top end guys, because, you know, certainly we've seen Indiana be able to get a Cody Zeller, be able to get a James Blackman Jr., be able to get, uh, you know, some of the really highly rated people, Romeo Langford. But outside of Zeller, none of those people really equated to a kind of a long term success. And in some cases, they had more disappointing seasons than successful seasons. And. Certainly, if you look at what Purdue chose to do in terms of recruiting, you've mentioned Braden Smith a bunch, but there's a there's a whole roster of people uh, that we've seen go there. Caleb First, uh, you know, Trey Kaufman Ren. I mean, th these are all these are all Indiana recruits or Indi state of Indiana recruits that I think looked at Indiana but came here, and and a lot of the players that Indiana has gotten out of the state of Indiana just haven't panned out. Well, you add to that the kind of disassociation that has seemed to be there among 
most of the coaches that have been at Indiana since Bob Knight retired. And even Knight wasn't great at it at the very tail end. Like he was really starting to recruit more outside the state. But, you know, Mike Davis, Kelvin Sampson, Tom Crean, once he hit that point where he kind of like lost his way, you know, like the the movement recruiting class and beyond. He got to a point where he didn't have to, which is like, that's the weird thing is he's like, well, now I can start recruiting the places I want to recruit. You know, and and then Archie Miller, who didn't do a great job of cultivating any kind of of fervor for IU basketball within the state, and I think my, you know Mike Woodson, who seemed like the perfect fit. It's like here's a guy who went to Broad Ripple High School and was an Indiana High School All Star, and was about you know year four of his program have two kids from Indiana on our team, and and we appear to have just kind of seeded, yeah. you know, really really hard level recruiting on players from the state of Indiana. So uh, a lot of this is choices that have been made over time. And it's disappointing, I think, for people that live in the state of Indiana. You see the the amount of talent. You see the amount. I mean, Tony Adrania had a nice graphic where he highlighted the number of kids from Indiana that are in the Final Four right now. Like, all of that matters. You can do that every year, which is what's annoying. <laughs> I know. Uh, now, do you need all of that necessarily to have a winning program? And, and you know, the answer is no, you don't. And we've talked about that quite a bit, about how sometimes the there's been an over-focus on Indiana prospects coming to Indiana. But that becomes a much harder thing to argue when you look at the success that Purdue's had and you look at how much of it has been built with kids that Indiana could have had, but they've chosen not to go that route. It's no wonder, in my opinion, that, as you said, Purdue's become kind of the epicenter of the culture of basketball in the state of Indiana because – you know, Purdue's managed to form not just a talented team, but a team that reminds many people of what they loved about Indiana basketball in the 70s and 80s and early 90s. And well, it's not just recruiting the Indiana kids. It's I mean, it, it, this goes to a and not, not, not Indiana, like this goes to a bigger problem, but it's just like it's the development of the players. We've talked about a bunch. It's like a little bit off the pot and on is like. You know, if if Braden Smith had come to IU, does he become Braden Smith? And like, really, the you know the the archetypes of Braden Smith or Gabe Cups, like they're kind of this. I mean, I'm being very broad here. They're kind of the same player, and like one has thrived, one is struggling, and is like if you swapped them, the, the real scary thing is like, would that have would would Gabe Cups have thrived at Purdue and Braden Smith struggled here? And you look at what we have. It's like, you know, Trey Galloway has had a good career at IU. Like, okay, he hasn't like I would say thrived at a high level. Like. He looks like a guy who might have been able to thrive in a Purdue system or like Anthony Leal has, you know, he was Mr. Basketball and, and just was basically DOA for three years. And like now is just starting to show like, oh, I can play on the court. It's like, why are we not able to develop these players? Because it's not, you know, that's the thing that's frustrating is like when you look at Purdue's roster and all, um, all credit to them, like Fletcher Lawyer wasn't a five star, you know, top 10 recruits like that was just a three, you know, two, three star dude who came in and was starting as a freshman and was cultivated and create, you know, all those guys are not five-star recruits. And that's the tough thing is we're, and we're getting some of the same kind of, you know, the pieces to put together, but none of them are developing. Yeah. I mean, and it's gotten progressively worse. Yeah, no. And it's gotten progressively worse since Crean left. And I mean, look, Crean's teams had their own trouble. We certainly had our complaints about them. They, they, they felt incomplete, especially on the defensive end more often than not, but you got to give Crean and his staff credit for the development they were able to do. It just wasn't, it wasn't consistent enough. And when the recruiting started to really dissipate at the tail end of his time, the hope was, oh, okay, you go and get someone who can bring that level of development back. And that certainly didn't happen under Archie Miller. And increasingly just looks like it's not going to happen under Mike Woodson. You're relying on five-star uh, cherry picks at the, Right. tail end of the recruiting process you're relying on portal guys uh you have seen some development it's not like it's entirely absent but when you look at purdue and you look at guys who have not only developed but have settled into roles and been yeah. supposed you know at least apparently happy with lesser roles because they're part of this larger system i mean that's ultimately what makes most of these teams and these programs successful at a high level look at uconn I mean, there's there's talented players down like through the ninth or tenth roster spots on UConn, and there's guys on the bench who are just like we're happy to play the roles that we're playing because we believe in this system and this system clearly works. Purdue's got the same thing, you know. Villanova had that, uh, you know. You you've got several other Alabama's kind of guy, I and mean, look at what Alabama was able to do this year. They were able to take three transfers from wildly different programs, several like a couple of, of pegs lower, 
and plug them into their system. And not only did they achieve what they achieved last year in terms of, you know, of, of they, they were slightly less successful in the regular season, but they went to the final four and, and gave UConn a great game until about the last five, six minutes of that game. So I, I think that it, you're exactly right. It's not, it's development. And it's like, what can we do with the players we're getting? And just because you're not, getting a recruit that someone else is getting doesn't necessarily mean the flip that that player would have come in and done exactly what they did elsewhere at Purdue or, or somewhere else at Indiana, because I just, do, it doesn't feel like the underlying system is there for the whole team. The, the system's there to some degree to support a key player like a Trace Jackson Davis or like a Romeo Langford when he was here. But to some degree, that puts a hard ceiling on what you're actually going to be able to accomplish. And when you look at what Purdue has accomplished, and this pains me to say this, given the the rivalry and just given my general feelings on on their program, they have established a model that's that's very sustainable. And for the average IU high school coach, or the average Indiana AAU, uh, the Indiana high school coach, or Indiana AAU coach, or the or an average Indiana basketball player at the high school level. I would look at that and say, that looks really attractive to play in. That looks like a system that works. It's not always the most attractive system, but you win a lot of games. You're in a national title game now. So for all the people, as you said, to wrap up your comments, who think, oh, Purdue winning a national title or even getting to a national title is going to help Indiana. I don't know that it does because I'm not seeing a lot of lessons being learned I mean, it's not like Purdue just woke up and was successful. Purdue was on the precipice of making a Final Four in 2019, and then they had that you know bizarre ending to that Virginia game. I mean, they've been good for a while, and that hasn't seemed to matter in terms of how Indiana's basketball program, under multiple coaches and multiple athletic directors, has approached the way that they're doing business. Yeah, well, and like you know, like I've said, you know, th- this feels very much like the Indiana playbook from the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, and so you know the the. The positive way to look at it is that, you know, during that time, you know, Purdue was unfortunately in the Indiana spot where it's like they didn't have the playbook or they were, I mean, they, they were trying, they had their own system, but you know, they they superseded and got our system or got this system and they did it and they've, they've replanted it. So it's like, it, it can happen again, but it's going to take, I guess this is the really sad part is, you know, I don't think, I don't think it's just Purdue owns a state now, but I do think, you know, they're, they're a legitimate contender and like they have it it's going to take indiana 5 10 12 years to to get back to the position they i mean if they have a couple of good years all the fans are going to come out and like that that process is going to be there but for for indiana to get back to kind of the sustained high level success keyword sustained like it's going to take probably 10 or 15 years to to do that well that, that's what sustained is it's like well that is just these little blips of you know i don't want us to just be the nc state in this spot here it's like we we i mean we have high level success. We just have it very infrequently. And this is something that, you know, unfortunately that's the really scary part as you look back, you know, even under night, I mean, a night had apex level success that is just unmatched anywhere else. But Indiana is not a program like UCLA or UNC where you have these like, you know, 15 year stretches where you're just like elite eight, sweet 16, elite eight, elite eight, like go and look at the night years. It's like title, and then missing the tournament, and then you know, yeah. good. Uh, you know, it's it's. I don't know. I I think that's a little unfair. Um, okay. I mean, because I because a I think the the game was different back then. Uh, in terms of you had a m- far fewer spots to get into the NCAA tournament. Um, I mean, yeah, they, they lose. They, okay, they they missed the NCAA tournament in 1977, but that's because you know the previous four years they'd gone Final Four, CCA title. Nearly undefeated season, undefeated season. I mean, you know, you're you're going to occasionally have a step back year, and I think you see that even in modern game. With North Carolina went from the title game to missing the tournament to being a one seed. Yeah. So, but the larger point, I I understand where you're coming from, and I think to me the biggest, the most frightening thing, if you're an Indiana fan, is that Matt Painter is 53 years old, like he's got a ton of coaching left in him, and. Like even just making a title game here puts you in a position if you're Purdue where you have essentially completely legitimized the whole project, you know, for all the people who have said up to this point, well, you know, that's great. You're just getting big guys and you're just playing big guys. And, you know, that's got a hard cap on it. Well, now you can say, well, look, we we had a big guy. We made him better for four straight years or three straight years. And 
Now we're in a national title game and win or lose, you know, that's a justification and something that we can put in front of people. And that's something that, you know, Indiana can't do. And that ultimately is not something that's going to go away anytime soon. Like I don't like, I look at painter. I'm like, that's not a guy that looks like he's on the verge of retirement. That's a guy where like he could coach for another 15 years and still be well under the typical retirement age for a coach at this point. If he wants to say that age, that's that actually shot. That's kind of like the fad model. Like what he's what he's only 52. Like I was, I didn't realize that. Like what's scary is like, we're, we're probably, you know, gonna have one, maybe two coaching changes before Purdue does. He's a, a, a other I'm fun not, fact. I'm not saying a fire. I'm just saying, like on an age thing, like Woodson. You know, this is not a fire Woodson thing, but it's like you know, Woodson's going to re- retire at some point in five or six years. Like Painter won't. So it's like that's the scary thing is like we're we're going to have a co- we're going to have to deal with other coaching change, which Indiana just pr- historically has not done awesome with. I would say. Fun fact: Matt Painter and I share the same birthday. We were born exactly nine years apart. So there you oh. go. Um, was there a solar eclipse that year? Let's just, well, yes, actually. <laughs> was the astrological thing that happened. So, anyway. Yeah. So look, I I'll say this. I don't know that winning or losing the title will matter much in terms of the cultural items you're talking about. Because whether or not Purdue wins on Monday, Purdue has demonstrated, I think, to the Indiana basketball culture, the people that matter, the players, the, the up and coming players, like that's the program that you want to be a part of. That's the program you're going to emulate. And look, people love winners. Fans love winners. Why were so many people IU fans, basketball wise, in the in the seventies and eighties and nineties, and even a little bit into the, the the aughts? It was because Indiana had won a bunch. It's like when you see Yankees fans walking down the street in in the middle of Indianapolis, or when you see Dallas Cowboys fans. Like, why are those people fans? It's because people are attracted to winners, and that's how they become fans. And You know, Dallas actually ends up becoming an interesting analog for IU basketball. There's still a ton of Dallas Cowboys fans out there, but most of them became Dallas Cowboys fans like between the 60s and the 90s. There weren't a whole lot of brand new Dallas Cowboys fans minted in the last 25 to 30 years. Indiana fans are kind of like that. We've talked about that a bunch on this show. Meanwhile, there's a ton of Purdue fans being minted right now. And look, Purdue will never be a more popular in-state option for the average high schooler in Indiana than than uh, Indiana. Like Indiana's got a lot of built-in advantages. Indiana's not an engineering school. Uh, you know, it's, it doesn't have national aspirations like Purdue does on the engineering front. Indiana's a liberal arts college. It's got a much more fun campus. Like people will still choose to come to Indiana, but the number of people who will choose to come to Indiana for the the campus scene, but will be retain their basketball fandom with Purdue. I mean, that's going to continue to go up unless Indiana starts to really take a hard look at what it's been doing and say, essentially we've lost our way. We've got to do something different. This is not like a Kentucky Louisville thing where like once Louisville really got that up and going, when Denny Crum got hired, suddenly like Kentucky Louisville was a legitimate you know, competitive thing where it's like both of those programs that they do different things, but they're very successful. Indiana and Purdue, it's always been Purdue has been, you know, in the eyes of of the state, maybe not always, but certainly since the 40s, Purdue's been the secondary program. They've had to recruit on the margins. Indiana has been the primary program that could kind of have their pick of the litter. And even though Indiana's had the ups and downs, they've had significantly higher peaks. Well, Purdue, if they win this, is going to have a peak of their own. And in the modern game and in the modern in- environment, not just with fans, but with players, I do think that that travels. And this idea that you're just going to be able to live in the portal or live off of sniping five-star recruits off of, of teams that have coaching changes or things like that, I-, I just don't think that's nowhere close to a sustainable enough model when you compare it to what Painter and Purdue have put together. And it's hard to argue with the results when they've been basically getting these results for eight years now. Two things there. First off, you, you you are right. People love a winner. The other thing that's you know like uh, the Cavs come into town. There's tons of Cavs fans when I, when I go to Pacers games. Like it's because LeBron James is there because people also like celebrity and like that's what Indiana had for 30 years. You had a winner and you had Bob Knight. You had this weird like people were fans of Bob Knight and then fans of IU. So it's like you had the double the double apex there and all of that is gone. You know, to me the 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 more nightmare scenario is you know we're talking about this now as kind of like a singular apex um, because they're in the national title game. But, you know, 
you mentioned like painters young, they have a system. They have another big guy. They have another seven footer coming right after Edie. And they'll probably have another one after that. You know, to me, where I think we need to have the discussion in a year or two is like, there's no world where maybe they go to back to back final fours or they could win two out of the next three national titles. Like now they've kind of broken through their own. You, you saw, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't make any logical sense, but you kind of saw it with like, you know, the Red Sox, like they just kept on hitting the wall and like hitting the wall. And then once they broke through, it's like, Oh, Hey, we, we can win a title. Like let's go ahead and win four in a row. I mean, it didn't so much work with the Cubs, but it's like, you do kind of see this where teams break through that ceiling. And then it's just like, Oh, it's all lifted. Like all that angst is gone. And like, let's just, let's go be good for a while. And so to me, that is, that is really where I do think things again, I'm just, everything you said is true. I don't think you're going to see a, a unbelievable, like, it just losing to Purdue. But it's like, if, if they go on a run here, they make two or three final fours, they win two titles in five years. Like that's going to really, really change. I mean, one is, is not going to help. Oh. Like that's where things suddenly change. And then it's like, all right, man, like, you know, they start calling us like, all right, CCNY, like you had a great, you know, you're, you're great. Like we're winning titles now. And like, you know, I don't think it's going to happen in the lifetime of this podcast, but if they ever surpass, surpass the five, Okay, um, now you're now you're let's that you're getting a little bit far afield here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the if they win their first on Monday and they have UConn's pace, which I is know. an insanely fast pace, they would win their fifth or sixth in like 2050. And if this podcast is still going in 2050, I've made a serious mistake with my life. <laughs> just saying. So, so I think we can take that out out the way. But look, there's a couple of things I will say to kind of close off this aspect of the conversation. First of all. Basketball's changing, college sports are changing, and there's going to be a different approach that has to be taken as we move forward because it's just it's not going to be the same game. And I think the one thing that Indiana, if it wants another renaissance, if it wants to try to counter what Purdue's done, like they need to be really smart and judicious about how they approach this new era of college basketball and try to be an innovator in terms of of running rosters that are actually successful. We've heard a lot from various sources about, oh, you know, uh, I mean, there's, there's people arguing online that like, no, Indiana doesn't need to like get with modern offense. You can win many ways. You don't have to shoot threes. Like that attitude is not the attitude that we're, we're asking for here. I mean, it's like be on the front foot. Don't try to play 10 to 15 years or 20 years behind. And the recruiting practices, the player development practices, as much as people try to focus on NIL is the big thing. Transfer portal is the big thing. Realistically speaking, uh, it's it's a mix right now, but you look at the two strongest teams in the NCAA tournament this year, UConn and Purdue. Yeah, they've got a couple of pieces that have come in via the transfer portal, but they've homegrown a lot of that talent or, you know, or they've been able to take talent and uplift it into a system where there were already pieces that they themselves had developed. And I think that that, that is a key element that Indiana's got to keep in mind. Who knows what the game's going to look like in five years? It's not a zero-sum game. Like, Indiana and Purdue can both be great at the same time. But Indiana's got to figure out, like, what culture does Indiana want in terms of its basketball program? What consistency can be provided in terms of building that? And, you know, the you often hear in relation to Indiana, well, this is what happens when you have multiple coaching changes. Well, that's true. But I think the other thing to keep in mind is that none of the coaching changes that have happened at IU were unjustifiable in terms of results. And, you know, so like I, you hear a lot with like the big like Brad Brown, Brownell at Clemson. They make to the Elite Eight, they lose to Alabama, but a lot of people afterwards were like, well, see, this is a reward to Clemson for sticking with Brad Brownell. And it's like, that sounds great, but re- you know, for Clemson, yes, absolutely. The fact they get to an Elite Eight, had a shot at a Final Four, is awesome. IU's got greater aspirations, and the idea that, well, we'll just hire this coach and not worry about the results and then occasionally have a successful year, I don't think that that's really the culture that Indiana basketball wants. Like You really have to nail the hire, and unfortunately, that just hasn't happened with right. Indiana. So that I think ultimately a lot of it starts with that. So much of it is coach-driven, and – if you don't have someone who is, has a sustainable model that can be built upon, you're going to end up in the situation Indiana's been in where they keep recycling every four to six years and you, you, you're, you know, the resets are bad, but sticking with someone who's not going to be able to elevate to the next level isn't necessarily good either. And I say that just in the macro because that's essentially 
all the decisions were defensible, but it's led to this situation where Indiana looks astray. And that, I mean, you can't really argue with it when people say that, you know? Yeah, and you, you kind of hit what I was going to say, so I'll be brief. But it's like that's – I hate that argument when it's like, oh, like, this is why you can't change coaches every couple of years. you got to have consistency. It's like, well, you know, comma, you need to have consistency with the right coach. Like the problem hasn't been that Indiana's changed coaches, is that we've had the wrong coaches and we've had to make changes. And like you said, in the, I'm talking about this in the macro, but it's like look at UConn. They changed coaches three times and won five titles. Like, no one's like, hey, UConn really needs a little more consistency. Like, we should, they shouldn't have hired early. Like, they really should have kept their guy. Like, th- that's the part that I hate. I, I, it's something with college sports. And let's, let's talk about IU's not portal stuff. It's like something with college sports where this, this permeates of like coaches are hired for life. And if you're not doing it that way, it's like coaches should be given always more time. Like, you don't hear this in the NBA, you don't hear it in the NFL. It, well. it's, it's this thing that permeates where it's like, you know, that's the problem. You got to give guys more time and they need more time. You can't be changing coaches. It's like, if you have the wrong coach, like it's never looked back again. I bring it up all the time. Like North Carolina had, you know, Brad Doherty for 18 months and he won like 20. Matt, sorry, Matt Doherty. Like, yeah, Brad. Yeah. Well, they had him too. Um, (laughs) um, But no, they, they had Matt Doherty for like 18 months. He won like 22 games his last year. They fired him. Like, you know, Kentucky had Billy Gillespie, who also wasn't like, didn't go like, you know, two and 28. Like he had a pretty good second year. They fired him. Like no one's being like, man, they really should have not hired Calipari and given Gillespie more time. Like that was kind of the wrong, like no one ever looks that way. It's just, it's always like forgotten the co- dot, dot, dot with the right coach. Anyway. All that said, I'm rooting for UConn. Go, go, uh, go Huskies. And I would say all that said, I, I think UConn's going to blow Purdue's door. I think UConn's really good. I think okay. Purdue's also very good. I think UConn is just like generationally good. I, I, well, that's the thing. I think, I, I think ultimately, watch us both be wrong on this, but I, I think that uh, UConn is just such a complete team, and they're just so yeah. steady. I mean, they were in real trouble in that Alabama game. Alabama went on that big run and and essentially, I think, tied the game or came close. And uh, I was talking with with a friend last night, and you know, he compared it, their tenacity to like Marvin Hagler. Like, they just came back out the next round after getting beat up. It was like, well, we're just going to land shots on the body, and suddenly they're up eight again. I mean, they are they are so impressive. Purdue's impressive too, but I feel like this is where the gulf in athleticism yeah. between UConn, who is really recruited and and formed like a, a team full of players that could play in the NBA at some point, versus Purdue, who's got a generational big man who's gotten some really good contributions. But ultimately, like if Braden Smith was struggling against the pressure that NC State's guards were putting on him, I really am fascinated to see how he handles what UConn's likely to do and UConn is one of the few teams that has a guy in Donovan Klingon that can probably guard Edie alone which takes one of the big advantages that Purdue's had of of requiring doubles in the post uh away so I I do feel like I think it's going to be a closer game uh that but I think I think the five five and a half point spread that's currently on the books is probably the right one so but the the positive way to look at it is if Purdue wins just look at the celestial calendar and like right. the next time an eclipse comes to Indiana, that'll be the next time. It's like, at least we know when their next band will be. It's like 2097 or something. There you go. Yeah. It's, it's good to have something to look forward to on this stuff, I guess. But, uh, the money, anyway, their, their reason for looking at the calendar, <laughs> we have the same thing. So let's switch gears. Uh, and just a reminder folks that we are moving into the off season, but we're not there yet. It's the 7th of April. And, We've got about three weeks until the portal closes. The portal closes on May 1st. And Indiana, thus far, has zero people signed in the portal. Bryson Tucker, not a portal uh, addition. I'm happy on that, not, you know. Well, uh, so uh, let me actually show something here. I wanted to to demonstrate. uh, If you haven't been to the portal tracker that Tony Adrania has been keeping up, I highly recommend it because, uh, let me get this up here. Everybody can see this. If you're watching on Spotify or on YouTube, you're seeing this. So this is the portal tracker that Tony Adrani put together. And it's it's very nicely done. It highlights like who the players are and where they're from, whether they visited or whether there's just been outreach, what the visit date was, what their statistics were, box plus minus, which is an important stat. If you've been listening to X's and Joe's, um, you can separate by outreach only or just all the prospects that are out there. You can see who's visited. And, um, you know, there's been a little bit of a dead period here, which is going to be starting back up again. We know that 
at the end of this upcoming week, Connor Hickman, who's the combo guard out of Bradley, is going to be coming to IU for a visit. We know that they've got visits lined up the following week with a couple of players coming in. We've also had some players cancel their visits, and we've seen players signing elsewhere. Now, there's still a free-for-all in terms of the overall numbers of players that are going to be out there doing things uh, and where they're going to land. I mean, that some of that's still up in the air, but it is an interesting situation for IU right now where you're starting to run a little short on time in the portal and there's, there's no clear sense of who's in what spot. And Scott, I know that we, you know, we're both a little bit leery of getting too excited on the portal stuff. We've actually seen some of this in our discord where people have gotten really fired up because a name will pop up and they'll talk about it and there'll be debate and then nothing happens. A lot of this was how it was last year where, you know, the, you, you'll hear names in the portal. You hear this person's connected with Indiana or they're interested in Indiana and then nothing happens and they end up going somewhere else. That's more the norm than the exception because there's so many players, but for Indiana, it is a bit of an issue given the number of spots they still have to fill on the roster, not just starting spots, but depth spots as well. It, it, it'd be nice to have some clarity about what Indiana is going to do. At least like who's the starting point guard going to be, or, you know, who are you bringing in to replace Khalil Ware or, or, you know, just some kind of sense of what direction the roster is going to take right now. You've seen a lot of names. You're not seeing a lot of action. And everything up to this point is mostly just speculation from people who don't really know, including, you know, I mean, you could even the sources who are like, oh, Indiana's in on this player. They'll be fine. They're going to get the guy from Washington State or they're going to get the guy from Stanford. It's like, well, that's fine. But we don't know that. And until the, the, the signatures on the bottom line, it's hard to really even have a sense of what you're looking at with this Indiana roster going into the next season. The, the thing that I'm disappointed in is, you know, I, I know we kind of joked about, you know, we, we should, India and the NIT probably wouldn't have been good anyway, but the idea of like, oh, we're going to focus on the portal, not the NIT. And then it's like, all right, well, the NIT is over. We haven't got anybody in the portal. But w- where I'm frustrated with that is I'll make a comp to the NBA real quick that, you know, you look at like the, the Pascal Siakam trade that the Pacers made, you know, they, they made that, but it's not in a vacuum because had they not made a trade for him, if they were going to go and try and get him in the off season, suddenly now they're competing with the thunder who have a bunch of picks and the Rockets have a bunch of picks. And that's what I did like about, about IU being like, all right, we're going to focus on this part of the portal, the beginning part when like theoretically Kansas and Yukon and Arkansas and, you know, Alabama and, you know, Duke, like they're, they're focused on the tournament. Arkansas is bad through that. And then Alabama, but like they're focused on the tournament. So it's like, we can try and maybe snipe somebody real quick before, while they're not paying attention. Well, that time's over. Like outside of UConn and Purdue, everyone else is kind of you know off the top rope. Like they're back. Like Alabama, you know, Alabama is back. Nate Oates is out there recruiting the portal right now, and so you kind of now you're fighting with all the big boys. That concerns me. The other piece that you brought up is that you know you look at the roster. Getting Lake Renew back is great. Getting you know McKenzie and Baco back is is good. You're getting that consistency, but this is the problem that Indiana has is they're fighting two things at once. You need to have that. You can't just flip over your entire roster, but with Galloway and Baco and renew back, you would, you would assume those are three starting spots that are already taken now. So those are, you know, those are spots that are not available for a portal guy to come in and take. And if you're a guy in the portal who is a high level guy in the portal, you probably want to go somewhere and start. Well, we have two more spots available for that. Um, And how you manage that is going to be tough and, you know, this is the thing that I – and so I, I look at that, like, the where the roster is now and what you're trying to get. I think it's going to be really hard to, to hit a bunch of home runs in the portal because the number of spots you're going to have on your roster is just going to turn into secondary spots. And as you have mentioned and we've talked about before, it's like if you're a high-level guy, if you're going to take a secondary role, wouldn't you rather do it at a place like Kansas or UConn versus a place like Indiana? Well, and you, you brought up a really good point there, which is this idea that was being floated was that the reason Indiana wasn't landing people in the first couple of weeks was, well, no, the, the guys that Indiana's looking at are still active. They're still playing. Well, as you just mentioned, like there's only two teams left. Right. And neither of them have players that are likely to come to IU in the portal. And w- where are the commits? Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the Elite Eight was done on Sunday of last week and yet nothing. And you look and it's look, it's early and I'm going to keep caveating with that it's early there's plenty of time indiana might still end up with a great portal class but it's hard not to be a little bit perplexed at the fact that you know 
Makai Mason is committed to Washington. Michi Johnson went to Ohio State. You've got Lynn Kidd at Miami. You've got Terrence Edwards Jr. who's committed to, to Louisville. Doug McDaniels, Doug McDaniels in Kansas State. Brandon Huntley Hatfield, not a huge loss there, but went to NC State. Jacoby Gillespie's at Maryland. Like these are teams in Maryland, especially that one kind of sticks in the craw because that's a team that Indiana really is directly competing against for talent in the category of teams that weren't in the NCAA tournament. And so I worry a bit about where this is headed because ultimately Indiana's got two kind of really three problems. A, there's a perception problem about Indiana in terms of style of play and the lack of accomplishment this past year, as has been pointed out multiple times, guys in the portal, high level guys in the portal tend to want to go to places that were in the NCAA tournament, you know, had a, a good level of success, had a good looking offense. Indiana has none of those things. And so that, that is an issue. The second issue is the number of roster spots that Indiana has to fill. You know, you, you had last year, you had a, an unfilled spot on the roster. And everybody's like, why you don't have high school recruits coming in to fill those spots. And so you've got this issue where you've got to you've got to fill a bunch of spots. You just have to as part of the course of being a basketball program, and then see within those spots, people who are coming at this echelon want to have playing time. They want to they want to be the starter. They you know, and and I think Indiana we ran into this last year. This was one of the excuses used. It's like well, Indiana couldn't land a guard because the spot the starting spots were all spoken for. I, I debate the accuracy of that argument but regardless that's been the argument that's been made and what you end up with is a situation where well you know you get one recruit one portal guy and suddenly that takes a bunch of other people off the table and now you're really dealing with a roll of the dice as you saw with a couple of the guys that indiana brought in i think last year where you may be settling for lesser talent who's willing to come, and they're still coming with a pretty big price tag. It ends up being a very difficult thing resource-wise. Not to say that Indiana can't do it, and maybe they'll thread the needle on this, but it does concern me a little bit that it's April 7th, and the next visit isn't for another week that we know about. It seems like you're trying to thread a very thin needle at that point, and I do worry, given Indiana's lack of success last year in the portal trying to do a similar thing, how well they're going to handle this particular time. Well, I, I would push back. I think they did well in the portal period last year. I mean, you got to, you got, well, and, and, and here, and here is my point is you look at what they got last year is they got one of the top five guys in the portal in Khalil Ware. they got a five-star, you know, transfer freshman in McKinsey and Baco. Um, and then they got a bunch of, you know, just ancillary, I don't think, you know, but you know, kind of like secondary pieces in the portal. That's what they did last year. I thought that was really good. And that equated to the season that we just had. You look at where we're at now. So if Bryson Tucker is kind of taking that McKinsey and Baco spot of like a five-star transfer, you know, five-star freshman coming in that, you know, we're not sure about, but there's some good lineage there. Okay, great. You have that. If you get one more stud in the portal, if you get a clear well type, sorry, where type in the portal this year, you get one of the top five guys in the portal. To me, it's like, great. You've now done exactly what you did last year. And, the, you know, how, why Why would the results be any different this next season? To me, it's like you've got to get two of the top five or ten guys in the portal still to, well, to make it better than what you did last year and get the other other pieces. This is, what's, this is what running it back is all about, Scott. No, but the, what, what, I, what I, I guess what I meant was, yeah, Indiana got Khalil Ware in the portal last year, and they deserve credit for that. And then Khalil Ware was a great player. And Indiana finished 90th in Ken Palm and wasn't in the NCAA tournament with Khalil Ware on the roster. So – where I say they didn't do well in the portal, what I mean is they didn't do well team building in the portal. They they didn't take the the outflow of players that they had. And I'm not talking about just Trace Jackson Davis, but I'm talking about Miller Cop and Race Thompson. They didn't find the complementary pieces to put around their existing players. They didn't find the guard depth that they needed or the starting point guard that they needed. And the the argument that, well, the mitigating circumstance was simply that Xavier Johnson got injured and, and that was that, I think that really does not account for the lack of effective contribution coming out of the portal consistently for IU. That is what Indiana is going to need coming into this year. They don't have another option. Uh, you know, that's where it's going to have to come from unless everybody on their team gets significantly better. And I don't know how realistic that argument is either given 
you know, I think Mackenzie and Baco's got a, a lot of room for growth. I don't know that you're going to get, you're going to get 5% more out of Trey Galloway. Are you going to get five, ten percent more out of Anthony Leal? Are you going to get, uh, you know, how much more can Malik Renew really develop and grow? I think these are all active questions. So it is daunting, and it's just, it keeps coming back to me to the second problem as opposed, you know, and it really feeds into the third, this idea that what is Indiana selling on the trail? Are they, you know, is it money? If it's money, that might help, but I think we've already seen a lot of players have chosen to go places that aren't necessarily financial decisions, but they are basketball decisions. And so I hope that what is being communicated is a vision that's getting people excited. I just, it's interesting that it hasn't had any effect so far. And after a while, it's like when you leave these things closer to the end, I think you put your team in a lot of jeopardy in terms of what you're able to bring in. I hope we're sitting here a couple of weeks from now and like, wow, Indiana really cleaned up in those middle two weeks of April. Uh, and clearly their plan was correct. I do think that there is justification to be skeptical about that right now, because I feel like we had similar conversations last year. And that was with Khalil Ware committing relatively early in the cycle well, this is not a lot else happened that was noteworthy from that point forward well and this is where you look at teams that you know like a purdue like a yukon that build teams collectively it's like there's a plan and plans take time and it's just it's very unlikely and there's not a lot of historical precedent of having what five or six open roster spots filling them all in two weeks and also suddenly building a team that makes cohesive sense for the next season like that's that's a very very as you said very small window to to hit and it's just it seems unlikely you can do this year in year out and I think this is where a lot of that concern comes from is just like this doesn't doesn't feel and or look like a way to cohesively build a team and that was the problem last year is the team seemed ill constructed it had interesting pieces that didn't fit well and on the way this works is like this is just I just don't see how it's possible that you could build the team that you want when the portal is it is such a mix of wires where guys are getting multiple offers and they might be leveraging you. And it's like, you just don't know what you're getting. And it's like, it's okay to add extra pieces here and there, but trying to build half your roster and make it a cohesive work while you're dealing with kind of the, the quicksand that is the portal of guys, maybe looking for this, looking for that. Like, I, I just, I don't know. And my, my fear is you're just going to end up throwing a bunch of pieces in the wall and be like, all right, let's see if this all sticks. Last year, Khalil Ware committed on April 10th, which is three days from now. But the difference was that year, the, the portal was 15 more days. Like the portal right. went well into May. It got shortened this year. So you're, the whole time scales kind of shot back a little bit. And so I am really curious to see what Indiana can do. And yeah, the, the, the complimentary pieces thing is a really fascinating aspect. But I think that was always going to be a, a problem for this upcoming roster. It was going to have to be kind of a let's roll the dice with guys that we think are going to play well together rather than a situation where you knew we've got a bunch of chemistry and like Purdue, let's add a Lance Jones, drop him into a situation that's already pretty well set. Or, you know, UConn, we know we've got a great system. Let's grab Cam Spencer and drop him into this system and see what he can do. Like that's those are the kinds of things that Indiana doesn't have the luxury to do moving forward. And so, you know, I like some of the names that we've seen. I like some of the potential scenarios until one domino falls, though, you can't really take any of those hypotheticals seriously. And again, this type of roster building for IU will be a really new thing, given that even in Woodson's first year, when he brings in Xavier Johnson and Miller Cop, he's adding them to a group of players that had been playing together for a couple of years by that point, and there was at least something to plug them into. This is uh, a slightly different version of the same thing. Um, like that team was built around a player that was you know, clearly going to go play in the NBA and Trace Jackson Davis. I don't know that that is necessarily the case with the roster that you've got coming in this year. Well, yeah, that's going to be an interesting thing to watch. Like you said, the, you know, we, we've already passed the time when like it used to be we were just competing with Maryland. Like Now you're competing with everybody that isn't Purdue and UConn, and in 24 hours you're going to be competing with everybody. And so suddenly now you know, a lot of those guys who are on the fence, they might have been waiting for a, an offer from Kansas or Kentucky or UCLA or Duke or USC, and it's like, those offers might come or they might be able to find more like a lot of your advantages were gone because that that to me was what was exciting is you had this two week window where it's like you were kind of you were the alpha in the transfer portal market and 
to me, it's like, that's where you got to look to like, not just get interest and visits. Like you got to close guys then because the other suitors are going to be coming. And now it's open water and I can be proven wrong. Maybe they've done all that. And the other, you know, the guys are going to see other things. They're going to put it together. Um, But you know, we, we shall see. And the the portal is ever changing because the names of, you know, there are still guys who are going to probably enter the portal because their spots are going to be taken by new portal signings. So it's, this is ever changing, but it is, uh, it's dynamic, man. And you got to be on it. And the, the idea that you've got to still hit two or three more really stud gets in the portal. And we're sitting at, you know, zero or a half. If you I mean, Tucker's a more of a recruit than a portal guy. It's like, it's just, it is like, all right, you, it's half gone. Like half the portal is gone. It's going to be an interesting next couple of weeks. And hopefully Indiana is able to put it together and, uh, and put together a roster that looks compelling coming into the upcoming year. And I am very fascinated to see what happens. And because so, like you said, we'll talk about it in the preseason, like the expectations to, you know, next year, like they're, they're going to have to be higher. Yeah. Just, just making a 10 seed isn't to me, feels like that's not good enough, but that's a whole different discussion. But it's like the expectations yeah. to me of this team are like, it's, we're not just, Oh, we just got to be better than not. You can't just be better than you were last year. Like at Indiana, you've got to start, it ratchets up every single year, whether you're on the right trajectory or not. Like the, to me, the expectation trajectory is it, it's the train is moving, whether you're on it or not. I, uh, I disagree to some degree that the expectations will be higher. I think among, among fans, there'll be a lot of talk about that. I think among media, there'll be a lot of talk. I think Indiana just making the NCAA tournament that year or next year is going to be viewed as a success on behalf of, the university and the athletic department, you know? And so that's, that's, uh, you know, so I just think, I think it's important to keep in mind. I think in the minds of certain fans and certainly certain, certain media and, and commentators, the idea is, well, Indiana missed the tournament this year. They're going to really have to like ratchet it up and be like a, you know, four or five seed. I don't think that's actually aligned with what the reality will be. And, you know, given what Indiana does in the portal, if, if for those of you who think maybe we're being too negative in all of this, I think Indiana's got a chance with the basis that they've got right now to at least be competitive uh, for the upper half of the Big Ten, maybe even maybe even higher than that, because I don't think the Big Ten's going to be very good next year. That opens up a whole nother front of conversation about does it matter how like good Indiana is relative to the Big Ten or does it matter how good Indiana is relative to the rest of the country? But that's really another debate for another day. And ironically, ties right back in with the very first thing that we talked about on the podcast today. So anyway, I think that's going to wrap it up for us. Scott, any final thoughts from you? No. Yeah, that's well. Uh, thanks. Yeah, for your, leave, leave me hanging there. That's great. Uh, Scott has no further thoughts. So uh, no, but anyway, we appreciate you folks tuning in as always. We will be back later on this week. We're going to have some uh, other content items besides just basketball. We'll have some more football talk. Uh, Should have a football guest on some point this week, which should be a lot of fun. And then we've got some other IU-related events coming up. Of course, Little 500 coming up soon. Going to try to have a podcast out previewing that. And we'll have some other items as well. So, uh, Scott, it's been great as always. I hope you have a good rest of the day and uh, enjoy, enjoy the enjoy the eclipse and enjoy the slightly warmer weather. Yes, yes, it's coming. Going to go mow the lawn right after this. Me too. Uh, Scott and I both doing our our jobs as homeowners, I guess. But uh, anyway, thanks to all you folks for listening. Thanks to our friends at Home Field Apparel, our presenting sponsor. Thanks to the Back Home Network, and thank you to the moon for giving us something interesting going on (laughs) on Monday for all those people and celestial bodies. I'm Galen Clavio. We'll catch you folks on the flip side. Bring back the bison. So long, everybody.